I'm so sorry. This is like the second week in a row that my phone has stopped recording halfway through worship services. And I think it's because I thought I had deleted all of the old videos off of my phones, but they were just sitting in a trash can and needed to be emptied. It's a, you know, extra task, I guess, I need to do the next time I try and delete things from my phone. I've learned my lesson. Speaking of lessons, this morning's lesson um, from Scripture comes from the book of Jonah, which if you'll remember at the very beginning, he's told by God, go and preach to the Ninevites, tell them that their wickedness stinks, and Jonah's like, no, and he runs away, and God's like, yeah, you should, and then there's the storm, and then there's this fish, and Jonah's like, fine, I'll do it. And then Jonah goes, and he preaches to the Ninevites, and he's like, God thinks you guys stink, you should change. And then they do. And that's where we pick up today. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, God relented and did not bring on Nineveh the destruction he had threatened. To Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. And he prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I, I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better that I die than that I should live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be this angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down in a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, and he sat in shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Now, God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give him shade for his head and to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm that chewed the plant and caused it to wither. And then... In the morning, as the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. And Jonah said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about this plant? It is, said Jonah, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you know, you've been concerned about this plant that you did not tend or make grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you were to get to heaven and take your seat at the great banqueting table, who would you least like to sit next to? Who would you be most upset to learn had been reconciled by God's gracious and loving mercy? Whose forgiveness would you find most offensive? Whose presence might cause you to turn down your invitation to the table of grace and storm out in a huff? Hell is populated by people with strong answers to these questions. For Jonah, if the Assyrians were in on the love of God, Jonah wanted out. Jonah was angry enough to die. I mean, can you imagine the sound of the almighty palm against the divine forehead? Jonah, for my sake, is it right for you to be this angry? To which Jonah harumphed and stormed out like a toddler throwing a temper tantrum. It's humorous until we realize that we can relate. We celebrate grace only so long as we can control its distribution. We're happy about the heavenly banquet until we see the guest list. We think forgiveness is a great thing for us. 
But, you know, at some point, there's got to be some limits, right? There are certain people and certain things that are just unforgivable. The book of Jonah is only a cute story about a fish when looked at from a distance. But when you dive deeper into the text, it becomes a troubling story, an eye-opening story about the nature of evil, and not in our enemies, but in us. Jonah sits outside the city, sulking and cursing God's grace and mercy. Is it right for him to be angry that God is so loving? Well, while hell isn't specifically mentioned in the book of Jonah, I do think it paints a rather accurate picture of what hell is like. As Jonah walks out of the city and away from the scene of God's reconciliation with the Ninevites, he walks directly into hell. The people in hell are miserable, writes Pastor Tim Keller. We see raging like unchecked flames their pride, their paranoia, their self-pity, their certainty that everyone else is wrong, that everyone else is an idiot. All their humility is gone and thus so is their sanity. They are utterly, finally locked in a prison of their own self-centeredness. And their pride progressively expands into a bigger and bigger mushroom cloud. They continue to go to pieces forever, blaming everyone but themselves. Hell is that, writ large. Tim Keller continues to unpack the modern delusions of hell in his book, The Reason for God. He says, modern people inevitably think hell works like this. God gives us time. But if we haven't made the right choices by the end of our lives, he casts our souls into hell for all eternity. And as the poor souls fall through space, they cry out for mercy. But God says, too late, you had your chance. Now you will suffer. Ha 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 ha. But that caricature just misunderstands the very nature of evil. See, the biblical picture um, is that sin separates us from the presence of God, which, which is the source of all joy and indeed all love, wisdom, or good things of any sort. Since we were originally created for God's immediate presence, only before his face will we thrive, flourish, and achieve our highest potential. If we were to lose his presence totally, that would be hell. The loss of our capability for giving or receiving love or joy. So by protesting God's mercy towards the people and animals of Nineveh, Jonah is essentially protesting the nature of God. By walking away from the scene in which God's grace is playing out in the hearts and lives of repentant Ninevites, Jonah is separating himself from God. His initial reluctance to preach to the Ninevites wasn't because he was afraid of them, as, as we might think initially, but it's because he hated them. He didn't want them to be forgiven, but he knew if he preached to them, if he changed their hearts, they would repent and God would forgive them. Jonah feels certain that God is wrong for forgiving them, and he is right for hating them. Chances are, if you ever catch yourself feeling good about hating someone, there is more that needs fixing in your own heart than in theirs. And we see this internal battle playing out in Jonah's own misery. If God's grace and mercy are being shared with Nineveh, 
And Jonah has decided he doesn't want them anymore. It's almost a comically remarkable level of stubbornness. Were it not so sad and so familiar. It reminds me of a short story by Dr. Seuss in which two creatures called Zacks have a standoff refusing to step aside. Because, you see, one was a west-going Zax who walks only west, the direction of walking well known to be best. And the other was an east-going Zax who walked only east and thought those who walk only west to be least. Anyhow, they both refused to step aside for the others, so proudly convicted to their principles and rigid adherence to the pursuit of one direction, and neither of them ends up going anywhere ever again. Now, if you have uh, ever heard me preach before, if you've read any of my previous sermons, um, you know that when I mention Dr. Seuss, there's only one inevitable thing to follow. There once was a feast at the table of Zod, a table so big all who saw it were awed. Zod sent out invites by cartload and train, by truck and by bike and by wagon and plane. Zod whispered invites and sometimes would shout, Zod wanted no one at all to miss out. Folks were excited to come to the feast, and they came from the north, south, the west, and the east. The Zubs were invited, and Zubs are well known to lean to the side. They are leaningly prone. Some Zubs leaned left with all of their might. The others, you guessed it, they only leaned right. Why they leaned? Hard to say, be it comfort or pride. Just know that the Zubs always lean to the side. And all went to the feast, and all were excited, and all felt desired because all were invited. How gracious of Zod! they all said with glee, to throw such a banquet and then invite me. On the day of the banquet, the Zubs came to eat, but there at the table, can you guess who should meet? A left-leaning Zub and a right-leaning Zub. They bumped heads as they sat at the table of grub. Oh my gosh, said the one as he rubbed his sore head, and just wait till you hear what the other one said. I'm so sorry, she said, and I hope you're all right. <laughs> and you thought that they are going to get in a fight. No, see, Zubs aren't that cruel. No, they're rather forgiving. A trait quite important for their style of living. You see, all the leaning they do, I should mention, means they often bump heads, though it's not their intention. See, when these Zubs sat down and bumped heads, no surprise, they each felt the need to then apologize. Then, with care not to bump, they took seats side by side and rejoiced that the table of Zod was so wide. Sure, they could have grown angry and they could have fought, but that's not a lesson that I want to have taught See, like the Zubs, we all lean to the left or the right. What I mourn is when leading then leads us to fight. You would think, since we're so prone to leaning and bumping, that someone might notice and, I don't think, to write something to teach us forgiveness and guidelines for sitting to eat at God's table. Oh, wait, it's been written. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, the word of the Lord for all who would hear it.